In Ira Levin's satirical thriller, The Stepford Wives, a young mother named Joanna discovers that her small town friends have been replaced by sophisticated robots manufactured over time by the town's men. How does she figure it out? The women seem too unidimensional, too perfect, too content to be exactly what their husbands want them to be. Joanna visits the library and reads old newspapers and realizes that the docile women around her once had been intelligent and complicated with interests of their own. Now they serve as beautiful, cheerful adjuncts to their husbands. Levin's book is meant to be a commentary on the sexist narcissism that lets some men treat women simply as means to their own ends. But in reality, we all have a little bit of the Stepford husband in us. We want our lovers and spouses to have intuitive access to our wishes, to know what we want before we even ask. Marital therapists call this a be spontaneous paradox. In therapy, couples often discover that the be spontaneous wish has them locked into a no-win situation. I want you to know how I'm feeling, but I don't want to have to tell you. Or, more specifically, I want you to bring me roses on our anniversary, but you should have realized that long ago. Now that I've told you, if you bring them next time, I'll just get mad. There are similarities between what we want from our spouses and what we want from God. In particular, we want the psychic fusion that is achieved mechanically in Levin's novel, when the replacement wife becomes simply an extension of her husband's dreams and desires. Have you ever sat through a wedding ritual in which one lit candle is handed to the bride and one to the groom so that they can simultaneously light a third candle and then blow out their individual flames? In a similar vein, Christians sing, We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, evoking fusion of mind and purpose in the spiritual community. The quest of the mystic is to be one with God, to be consumed by His presence. The quest of the servant leader is to be the hands and feet of God. But because we are human, those individual candles never really go out. What people want, inevitably, is that God becomes a channel through which they can work their will in the world. That is the point of intercessory prayer. What is at the very heart of human desires? To be loved. And isn't it interesting that, according to Christian teachings, love for you and me is the emotional core of the risen Jesus, the one who dwells in human hearts and hears the prayers of little children. We move through the world with all of our imperfections, and He loves us unconditionally. So He intervenes for us when it comes time for taking math tests or finding parking spaces and he forgives us everything short of voting Democratic. I'm being ironic about how small-minded our God-self fusions can be, how small mine was when I was a believer. But in reality, the feeling of being loved and forgiven, and consequently deserving, is both powerful and tremendously empowering. It allows us to love and forgive ourselves and to ask so that we may receive. This benefit accrues to believers, even if the Jesus who loves them is not real. Approximately 65% of preschoolers, especially those who are firstborns or onlys, meet some of their social needs by creating imaginary friends. One of the appealing aspects of the imaginary friend is that she or he is at her creator's call, perfectly available when needed perfectly absent when not, ready to engage in whatever play activities, conversations, or even spats that a child may prefer. Research suggests that these imaginary friendships have real-world benefits. For example, they appear to help children hone their verbal skills or explore difficult feelings. They offer comfort and companionship. I might ask whether a loving Jesus, again, whether real or not, plays a similar role for adults. But before I could ask that, a preliminary question would have to be addressed, because I'm not sure that I know what Jesus loves me means. At a feeling level, 
Love means having a sense of tender affection for another person, gaining pleasure from their proximity or even their mere existence. At a hormonal level, it means being flooded with oxytocin. At a functional level, it bonds parents to children or spouses and friends to each other so that social interchange doesn't have to be based on rational calculus, which isn't nearly as compelling. But God loves me? What does that mean? My Encarted Dictionary says that in Christian belief, God's love is the mercy, grace, and charity shown by God to humanity. That sounds close. But the Bible says in many places that God is merciful, generous, and full of grace. It also says that He is loving, and I think the writers meant it, because we humans don't know how to conceive of a person God without emotions. How would we relate to a Spock God? How would He respond to our emotions? Imagine bearing your deepest feelings to an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent supercomputer in the sky who doesn't love you. Persons without emotions are the stuff of comedy or tragedy. To reiterate, it makes sense that we expect Jesus to have emotions, that we say His defining emotion is His great love for us, that we imagine Him to offer the unconditional affection that we couldn't get from our parents. Well, perhaps this should make us a little bit sheepish. It could be true, but it sounds indistinguishable from wish-thinking. The Jesus of the Gospels is emotionally complex. He is not as complicated as the God of the Hebrews, but he gets angry at times and he weeps. His emotions usually have a proportionality that provides a foil against Yahweh's mood swings. But the Jesus of modern Christians, especially liberal Christians, has a bit of that same two-dimensionality that caused Joanna in Stepford to become suspicious. Perhaps, it should make us suspicious too.